So Josh talked about why we're doing this course and what's coming up. This is the first lecture, Deep Learning Fundamentals, that actually has the, I guess, the content. But there's a lot of content in Deep Learning Fundamentals. And most of it is going to be a review for most of you. That's what we assume. That's the purpose of our um, requirements for enrolling. But if what I'm going to talk about in this lecture real quick is not going to be mostly review for you, then I highly recommend that you go through this uh, online textbook, neural networks and deep learning.com. It's something you could probably do in like a focused day or two. It's not like a big textbook. It's more of a website. So I highly recommend that. And uh, our weekly reading is actually from this uh, textbook. It's a chapter from this book. So today what we're going to talk about is neural networks, universality of approximation, the types of learning problems that neural networks can be used to solve, uh, loss functions and, and minimizing them, gradient descent being a method for that, backpropagation, um, architectural considerations, and the concept of, I guess, GPU compute, CUDA, cores, stuff like that. So let's kick it off with neural networks. Um, and you guys see the screen that has like the slide and nothing else on it, right? Sure. Okay. So neural networks are called neural because they are biologically inspired by neurons, right? Which do all the computing in our bodies. And uh, the, the kind of mental model of a neuron is that it's a cell that has things coming out of the main part called dendrites and you can think of them as like receptors of an of information and then if enough stimulation has been received by the dendrites then the whole neuron does a thing called firing it's basically an electrical impulse that um, begins you know in in the cell and then propagates down this long branch called the axon and the axon terminates in little branches that are basically adjoining other neurons as dendrites. Okay. And so it's like a network of these neurons getting stimulated. If they get stimulated enough, they fire uh, and the little electrical potential travels down this long branch and stimulates other neurons in turn. Mathematically, you can think about this as a pretty simple function called, you know, which is often called the perceptron and it really dates back to the 1950s. So it's a pretty old concept in computing, but you can think of the stimulation arriving at the dendrites as uh, basically inputs, right? So X sub naught, X sub one, X sub two, and so on. The dendrite itself, like where it meets the, the input that's coming in, how exactly much it gets stimulated by that input is determined by a weight. So W sub zero or W sub one, W sub two. And you sum all that up, right? So you have that sum over I of W sub I X times X sub I. And that's really like the neuron getting stimulated by the input. And then there's B, which is just a bias because this is a linear function. You kind of want a little offset for the uh, Y intercept basically. And then the whole thing is enclosed in some kind of activation function because the way that a neuron works is like, it's either fully on or fully off, right? If it's stimulated enough, it fires. And if it's not stimulated enough, then it doesn't fire. And so there's an activation function that basically is a threshold function. Like if, if enough of the sum, uh, if the sum kind of exceeds the threshold, it passes it on. Otherwise it remains off mostly. What are some good activation functions? Well, classical neural network literature really used um, the sigmoid function, which is over on the left. And it's a simple function that kind of squashes everything into, you know, no matter what the input, the output is gonna be between zero and one. And it's gonna be it kind of asymptotes at zero for negative inputs, and then it asymptotes at one for positive inputs. And then in between around zero, it quickly changes from zero to one. So that's, that's kind of what you want to see in an activation function. It has a nice derivative, right? Which can also be called the gradient. 
uh, G prime, uh, which is displayed in orange here on hyperbolic tangent. I'll just skip over. That's another one that people have used. Uh, but in recent times, people have mostly used the activation function on the right called the rectified linear unit or the ReLU, also known as a max function, right? Because it's literally just saying whatever input comes in, if it's above zero, then pass it on. And then if it's not above zero, if it's, if it's less than zero, then, then don't pass it on. It's zero. Um, and the gradient for it has a discontinuity, but that's fine. So basically the gradient is one if the input was, uh, was, zero, was, was greater than zero or it's, or it's uh, zero otherwise. And this is part of the innovation actually that really kicked off the deep learning revolution in 2013, the ReLU. So what's a network? Like what makes, so we talked about neurons individually, we call them perceptrons, but what makes a neural network? So if you arrange perceptrons in layers, like you do here, that's where the, the terminology of networks uh, comes from. And usually there's an input layer, that's whatever your input data, and then the input layer connects to a hidden layer, that hidden layer connects to another hidden layer. There's some number of those. And then finally, there's an output layer. Now, each one of these perceptrons, right, that make up this network has its own uh, weight and has its own bias. And that's really the setting of these weights and biases determines how the neural network responds to input. So the next thing we wanna talk about is universality which is, you know, this neural network represents some function y, right? y equals f of, of x, the input, and then w, the setting of all the weights. But what can that function be, right? Let's look at this function on the left, f of x. Very, you know, lots of peaks and valleys in here. How can we know if there's a neural network that uh, and a choice of weights for it that can basically represent this function. And to summarize, you know, some theoretical results, you can prove that any two layer neural network, so that's one hidden layer, right? So inputs to one hidden layer, two outputs. If given enough hidden units can be found to have, you know, some set of weights that can approximate any function. So that's known as the universal approximation, you know, theorem. And a little bit of intuition about why that should be true can be obtained if you go to that neural networks and deeplearning.com website, go to chapter four. Uh, basically, you can think of each one of the perceptrons. So you have a hidden layer of maybe thousands of perceptrons or millions, right? And each one of them, you can think of as an impulse function that, uh, you know, is either just kind of adds a column, right? Uh, here, the columns are in orange. The original function is in blue. If there are enough of these columns and they kind of go up and down, you can represent anything, right? It's almost like a Fourier transform of this function. So that's quite interesting. I think I'll just pause for questions later. Um, the takeaway is that neural networks are just incredibly general. And like, at least theoretically, you can represent any function using a neural network. So what do we use neural networks for? Well, we do it for machine learning. What kind of machine learning problems are there? There's three kind of big, you know, a breakdown of all the machine learnings out there. You can have three categories, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. There's also transfer learning, meta learning, you know, imitation learning, all these different types of learnings, but these are the three big categories. So supervised learning, actually unsupervised learning, you get unlabeled data X. So that means, you know, X can be maybe um, sound clips, right? Or text, like text strings, but there's no, nothing else associated with them. It's just the sound clips and the text strings or images. And the goal is really to learn the structure of that data. So you learn X. The reason you want to do it is because you can generate uh, more of these types of data. You can generate fake sound clips, images, or reviews, um, but you can also obtain insights into what the data might hold. So here's some fake text. You know, 
an Amazon review that you can just generate using a neural net. Here is the concept of clustering. So you have some data, you don't know anything about it, you don't have labels for it, but just because of how it's structured, you might infer that there are clusters, right? Like some process gave rise to this data, such that the data over here came from one process and the data over here came from another process. Supervised learning is you get both X and Y. So X being the raw kind of input data and Y being a label for it. So now you could have maybe an image and then a label. Uh, a label could be, you know, does it have a cat in it? And the goal is to learn a function that goes from X, so an image to Y, a label for it. And the goal for that is just to be able to make predictions. So if I get an image, I can say it's a cat. If I get a sound clip, I might be able to understand that it's a person, you know, speaking the words, hey Siri, and untold other examples of that. And then reinforcement learning, the goal is to learn how to take actions in an environment. So there's some kind of agent, maybe a robot, maybe uh, a computer virus, you know, or, or something. It can take actions. It can maybe move forward. It can, you know, look somewhere. And because when it takes an action, you know, reality provides some kind of uh, input back to it because it's acting in an environment. And you can interpret that environment as basically providing a reward or not to the agent and then changing the state that the agent is in. So like if a robot was in this place and then it took a forward move in action, well, now it's in this place and maybe there's a reward associated with it or maybe not. You can train, uh, for example, game playing agents using reinforcement learning. So here it's like, you know, the action is placed down a, a piece on the go board and then the reward can be like, did you eventually win the game or not? And the state is obviously just the state of the, of the go board. So commercially viable, is mostly supervised supervised learning, right? And then reinforcement learning is definitely up next. And um, and and Peter, you know, is working at Covariant.ai, which is a, a company doing exactly that. But also unsupervised learning, I would say, is also up next at this point with OpenAI, for example, productizing GPT-3 and all the things that that enables that would fall under unsupervised learning. I'm gonna just skip this. Well, maybe I won't skip the unsupervised learning. So one example of an unsupervised learning problem might be to just predict the next character in a string of text. So there's a, maybe a blog post by Andre Karpathy you've seen called char RNN, but it's basically using an RNN to feed in one character at a time, and then the um, RNN can output also characters. And what you end up learning is a language model that if you just kind of get it going with a word, it'll just keep writing just by generating character after character. And it's, and it's very impressive what it can output just with that simple input type and, and model. Uh, another unsupervised learning problem might be just understanding word relationships. So here the input would be um, actually words in a vocabulary. So like imagine your vocabulary is 30,000 different words. So then each word would be represented as a vector that's all zeros except for one in the place that corresponds to that word in, 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 in like some you know, list of words. Well, if you feed in a bunch of those vectors into a system that's properly kind of set up and trained, you can actually determine that there are certain relationships between words, um, such as like man to woman is as king is to queen, right? In, a, in the canonical example, which is quite interesting. Um, in computer vision land, you can try to predict the next pixel instead of the next character in text, you can predict the next pixel. So you can get something going with just a little bit of an image and then it auto completes it. Um, you can, you can train this kind of stuff by, for example, trying to compress an image down to like a very small representation uh, called a latent vector, and then expand that latent vector back out to an image. And that 
uh, can can learn a very compressed representation of a kind of a rich input source. And then lastly, you know, the culmination of this line of research maybe is uh, generative adversarial networks, GANs. So there, the idea is that there's a generator, which is like generating this kind of fake images or text or something. But then also there's another model, a neural network called the discriminator. And the goal of the discriminator is to be able to tell apart the generated images or pieces of text from actually real images or pieces of text. And the goal of the generator is to produce images or text that can fool the discriminator. And if you set up the system and you train it, you get very impressive results that are getting impressive, like more impressive every year. I mean, we've all seen deep fake videos at this point. And um, if you go to this face does not, or this, what is it? This person does not exist.com. You'll see an infinite number of GAN generated faces. That is really uh, fun to look at. I also saw this anime does not exist.com today. And in reinforcement learning, you have a lot of examples. I think Josh covered some of them. So, so next up, let's talk about um, what's known as risk minimization and the concept of loss functions. So let's talk about linear regression for a second. Um, so linear regression is the, so here I'm showing you what's known as one dimensional data, right? So there's one dimension on the X axis, just some number. And then there's another dimension on the Y axis and that's the output. So it's one dimensional input data producing one dimensional output. And the question we may want to ask is like, well, if we get an input, let's say it's 30, um, how can we predict what the output is likely to be, right? Given that all this data that we've seen, when we see a new data piece, but we only see the input part of it, not, not what the output's supposed to be, can we predict what the output is supposed to be? And you can, right? And the mathematically kind of robust way to do it is to put a line of best fit through this data. And the reason it's a line is because there's no reason to believe it should be anything other than a line with like this kind of data. But how do we find what that line should be, right? So the line will be able to tell us like if we feed in X, it'll give us Y because it'll multiply X by some number and then add another number, right? So it'll be like AX plus B. But what should A and B be set to, right? How should we set this line? Well, we, what we can do is we can minimize the squared error between all of the data points that we've observed and some candidate line, right? So given some line, which is just defined by two numbers, A and B, we can compute the squared error on all the data that we've seen. And it's done as in, as in this uh, formula right here. Um, and then we can try to find the settings of the line, you know, A and B parameters, A and B that minimize the squared error. And that'll be the line of best fit. And more generally, we can call this min, uh, squared error function, a loss function. And our goal is to minimize the loss function. Okay. So we find the setting of weights and biases like a and b that minimize the loss function and this is the whole idea of empirical risk minimization now in neural nets the function f um, given you know w and b weights and biases of x that's the neural net so weights and biases are the parameters of the neural net the loss function is can be you know mean squared error um, or maybe it's some other type of loss but that's basically how you would train uh, or how you would determine whether a neural network is solving the problem or not and for classification um, all that changes so regression being you try to predict from the input to some real valued output classification you predict from input to some categorical output, right? So it's not, it's never going to be like 2.3 as an output. It'll be exactly zero or exactly one or exactly two. And these things will correspond to like the label of the data point. And for that, we typically use cross entropy loss. And you will learn a lot about this in the reading this week. Okay, so we have the loss function, 
So we can kind of see like, all right, if we have some weights, we can understand how good or bad the, the, the model is, but how, what do we actually do with that, right? Well, our goal is to find the weights and biases that optimize um, this function, as in minimize the loss. And it might be a crazy looking function, right? Of the, this, loss, this loss function given the data might be quite crazy looking. What we can do is we can update each weight <clears throat> by setting it to the current setting of the weight, okay, minus some alpha, which is can be called the learning rate, and then the gradient of the loss function with regard to the weight. So we have some random parameters. We uh, evaluate them on the, on the data that we observed. We obtain, we, we can compute the loss function. And then in order to improve the fit of the neural net to the data, we will update each weight by doing this. We'll just subtract um, the gradient of the loss function with respect to that weight multiplied by some learning rate. That's all there is to it. And uh, the way we want to do it is we always want to move in the direction of kind of steepest descent. There's some tricks to making sure that if, you know, if, if your data is lives in like some part of the space that's kind of smaller than it could be, gradient descent will have a tougher time than if the data was what's known as well conditioned, which means that it usually has kind of zero mean and equal variance in all dimensions, because that gives the gradient descent kind of the most signal to, to follow. Um, so we can talk about weight initialization, we can talk about normalization. These are all first order methods, the, the gradient descent being, you compute the gradient, right? First order gradient, and then you just update the weight with that gradient. There's also second order methods, right? Where you can compute the second order derivative of the loss function with regard to the weight. Um, but we don't typically use them because they're very computationally intensive, but there are some approximate second order methods that can play a role in training neural networks more quickly. And if you just remember the name Adam, right? That, that would be the optimizer we're gonna use in the labs um, and that's what it's trying to do, approximate second order. And lastly, we could look at all the data we've ever seen, compute the loss, update each weight, but in practice, it might be better to actually compute the gradient on just a subset of the data, not the entire data. So this is known as batch gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. And stochastic gradient descent might use a batch of just size one, right? So you, you look at one data point you compute the loss on it and you update all weights with just that loss. And then you look at the next example. So that's known as stochastic gradient descent. And the reason to do it is because it's a lot less compute per step, right? You don't have to go through all the data. You have a million images on ImageNet just to update the weights the first time. You can just look at 32 images, compute the loss, update the weights. And then the next batch of 32 you look at the model is going to be a little better suited to the data. So there's, it's going to train faster using less compute, but it is more noisy. Um, but basically it's what we do. We use batch gradient descent to train. So back propagation um, is something that we can talk about now because we've reduced the whole concept of learning to just optimizing a loss function, right? We're just trying to find weights and biases that, that minimize this loss function. And we figured out how we can do it with stochastic gradient descent, which we can do by basically taking a batch of data, computing the loss function on it, uh, computing the gradient of every weight with respect to that loss function, and then updating every weight with that gradient uh, times some learning rate alpha. But how do we efficiently compute these gradients? You know, it's easy to say, well, we'll compute the gradient. How do we actually do it? So gradients, just another word for derivatives and derivatives you've seen in your calculus class, right? It's just, it, you know, you can do it symbolically. You can figure out given a function, what its gradient is. 
but the neural net is never just like you know e to the power of x or something like that it's never going to be that easy to compute its gradient but that's okay because the neural net is made up of computations where each of the computations does have a gradient because it's maybe just a linear function like ax plus b right that does have a gradient and then we can apply the chain rule for everything such that we can get the gradient of the loss function with respect to the weight way at the bottom of the neural network very far away from the loss function just by kind of chaining it through all of the layers of the neural net and that is called back propagation right and the good news is that we don't have to even code up the derivatives ourselves because we use automatic differentiation software. So that's like PyTorch or TensorFlow or basically anything else you're likely to see will compute the gradients for you. So all you need to do is just program the forward function like f of x, you know, given weights w, and then PyTorch will automatically compute the gradients for you. So the simplest neural net architecture is what we've been talking about, also known as a multi-layer perceptron. It's literally just perceptrons arranged in layers. Um, that's all it is. Sometimes this is called a fully connected layer instead of a, instead of a, uh, a perceptron layer. Um, and we know that that's really all we theoretically need to represent any kind of function but we might need like an infinitely large such network and we might need an extremely large amount of data to actually learn the weights that will do the right thing. So what we can do instead is we can encode knowledge that we have about the world into the architecture of the neural net. So for example, for computer vision, we use convolutional networks. And what that means is that it's a set of weights that are kind of tied together. And so no matter where in the input they're applied, they're always in a structure that's local, which is actually what happens in our eye, which we know from you know studies of the eye and the brain. And it's also what makes sense for the world because the world is composed of objects that um, don't radically change as you move around them and as they get closer to you, right? It's an edge is gonna be an edge, even if it's closer to you, it doesn't, it doesn't change. And for sequence processing, like a natural language processing, we use often recurrent networks, which have temporal invariance, which is something that's usually true for sequences like text. Um, the, the rules of language don't change as the sequence wears on. It, the rules are gonna be the same no matter where in the sequence you are. And so your neural network can kind of know that by um, being structured in a certain way. And then um, when we optimize these neural networks, well, we can have, let's say, 10 layers where each layer is not so wide. So maybe it only has like, you know, 10 channels, but there's 100 layers. Or we might have 10 layers, but each one has 100 channels. So that's like depth over width. Which one is better? Well, that kind of depends on like empirically what we've observed. There's no theory that really can help you out here but certain things work better in practice. And so part of being a deep learning practitioner is just really kind of obtaining that knowledge by doing it, by reading papers, taking courses like this. Um, skip connections, you can connect the input kind of around the layer that's processing it so that the output of the layer is added to the input itself. And that tends to help a lot in, in backpropagation. There's all kinds of tricks that we're gonna you know, cover And lastly, why exactly, you know, did things kick off in 2013? I mean, we had bigger data sets, but we also got good libraries for matrix computation on GPUs, particularly with NVIDIA CUDA, right? And that's using graphical processing units, which had, you know, until this point been only used for gaming, but with this CUDA library being released by NVIDIA, you could use that graphical processing unit to just do general matrix computations, which was uh, uh, very applicable to a lot of scientific computing, including deep learning. And the reason it's so crucial for deep learning is because all the computations in neural networks, all the computations that we've seen are just matrix multiplications. And matrix multiplications are easy to paralyze over the 
uh, computational cores of a GPU.